Welcome to Behind the Line, where we pull back the curtain on the challenges facing first responders and frontline workers. The work you do is unique, and so are the stresses that go with it. Join me as we tackle key issues to reduce risks for burnout, and as we work to support you in doing the job you love without sacrificing being the kind of person you want to be. Hey, frontline friends, and welcome back to Behind the Line. I'm your host, Lindsay Foss. If you're new to Behind the Line, what you should know about me is that I'm a clinical counselor specializing in trauma therapy. And after years of working with first responders and frontline workers around issues like burnout, compassion fatigue, PTSD, and related OSIs, I have become a passionate wellness advocate and educator for those who sacrifice so much for our communities out on the front lines. Behind the Line is a place for us to talk about the real life behind the scenes challenges facing you on the front lines. I created this podcast with the hope of bringing easy access to skills for wellness, allowing you to find greater sustainability both on the job and off. Addressing wellness for first responders and frontline workers can't really happen without acknowledging the massively broken systems within which you work. Certainly, some are better than others, and every broken system is invariably made up of so many good people doing the best they can. But in the midst of the good people and the good intentions, the hard work and the devotion to helping, broken systems break good people. I say this because it's one of the things I've personally and professionally found to be the most challenging when it comes to working alongside first responders and frontline workers, whether in my work or in my life as a friend or relative to someone on the front lines. It's crazy making because the brokenness goes so far up the ladder that it feels impossible to change it. Meanwhile, we are constantly watching really incredible people sink in the midst of the weight of the work and the lack of support. Lack of support is sometimes the best version of the story. In many cases, I hear stories of intentional aggression and active efforts by the system to undermine caring professionals who just want to make a difference. While I am generally an eternal optimist, I will admit that working in this space can knock the optimistic wind out of me at times. And if that's how it feels to me as an outsider to the lived experience, then how much more is it impacting you out there in the trenches of it? In many more ways than I can tell you, these pieces of systemic brokenness were significant factors in my decision to start this podcast. I kept hearing similar stories from varying helping professionals. Police and RCMP, corrections officers, firefighters, paramedics, 911 dispatchers, nurses, doctors, social workers... While the job descriptions were different, the stories had so much overlap. Feeling undervalued, overstretched, unheard, overworked, overwhelmed, and unsupported. Stories of responding to incidents, following the training and protocols to the letter, only to be suspended without pay during lengthy investigations and little to no support provided during this critically stressful time. It happens, we see it, whether you've experienced it directly or watched it unfold towards others in your workplace, it's hard to avoid, and the impact to our wellness can be catastrophic. When I say that all of this was among the factors that made me decide to start this podcast, I don't mean that I think we need to spend hours airing out all the junk that happens within the systems level of your work. I mean, I'm sure we could, but I don't think that would actually be helpful. What I actually felt compelled towards when taking on this podcast was to create a space to train up a new generation of leaders. See, part of the challenge is that systems are almost always some version of broken, just because they are. But a huge amount of the brokenness comes from people going up through the ranks who lack understanding of the work you do on the front lines, the impacts that it has for you, and the skills to be able to offer something better than the brokenness they inherited when they moved up that next rung on the ladder. But what if we changed that? What if you were the change to that? I have this hope 
silly as it may seem, that we can cultivate a new generation of helpers, change makers from the inside out, professionals who choose to value their own wellness, the wellness of their colleagues, and the collective wellness of the organizations within which we work and those we serve. I believe that when we anchor to operating as this kind of person within the system, alongside others who are committed to doing the same, we have power to fundamentally shape and change how the whole thing operates in ways that would benefit those within the organization and those the organization serves. I believe this because research backs it and because I've actually lived it. And I'm going to tell you about both of these pieces today. When I first graduated from grad school and entered into the field of counseling, I initially worked for a nonprofit agency that supported domestic violence and sexual assault survivors. I loved my work with clients, but quickly discovered tactics within the management system that seemed eerily similar to the tactics I would discuss with clients about guilt tripping, gaslighting, manipulation, and coercion. I watched several coworkers go on stress leaves, quit, or be spontaneously fired within a very short period of time. I noticed that I was dreading going to work. I was keeping to myself more and withdrawing from visiting coworkers during my lunch breaks, and I felt tired all the time. The weight of the systemic pressures was intense. In the midst of a job that I was new to and felt insecure in as I tried to find my footing within the organization and the profession, the person assigned as my clinical supervisor was also the person who signed my paycheck. Most would identify this as a conflict of interest, that there isn't sufficient safety to share what needs support in sessions when you fear for your job security. But that seemed to be an irrelevant concern and was never addressed. I learned a lot in my years working in this space. I met some incredible people that I feel blessed to have known, and I learned that I love working with trauma survivors, and I learned how not to lead. When I had the chance, I started a private practice. It was slow at first, gradually growing alongside my nonprofit work for a year or two. When I had the chance, I left the organization and struck out on my own. I continued to love my work with clients, but it got a bit lonely and I knew I wanted to do more. I supervised students and trained interns and created a reputation in our area as someone who cares deeply about supporting whoever I come in contact with. Over time, my private practice evolved and grew into a group counseling clinic, Thrive Life Counseling and Wellness in Fort Langley, B.C., Within a couple of years, we grew to being the largest clinic in our area with a diverse team of exceptional clinicians. Our team currently includes 18 clinicians, and we're in the process of bringing on a clinical fellow and several interns. In all of this, one of the joys of my life is being gifted the opportunity to lead and mentor this team. As I support each of them in various ways, it allows them to thrive which vicariously allows them to support their clients to do the same. When we opened Thrive Life in 2017, I picked up a book very shortly thereafter called Dare to Lead by one of my all-time favorite authors, Brene Brown. Brene Brown, for those who don't know, is a social work professor and researcher in the U.S. She's written several bestsellers about topics related to shame, vulnerability, connection, and being with ourselves. Her work led her into opportunities to research large organizations and systems, including health systems, public service systems, and military systems, along with Fortune 500 companies and private sector systems. Her book, Dare to Lead, which I'll link to in the show notes along with some of her others that I love, tackles what she's learned from her research in these spaces about effective, courageous, and heart-centered leadership. I inhaled the book. I soaked in every piece of it, and I actually continue to review it once in a while to keep me anchored and aligned to what I believe to be the fundamental skills for effective leadership. 
My husband jokes that it's one of the books where there are more lines highlighted than not, and I would have been better off to highlight the unimportant parts. It would have saved me a few highlighters. Her work gave language to what I knew I wanted to create and offered specific and tangible skills to actively work at creating it. What this has meant for Thrive Life is a culture that is unlike anything I have ever been a part of before in my life. The depth of regard and valuing that our team shares for one another, the efforts to connect and mutually support one another, the space to be silly or struggling, the permission to grow, create, and innovate. It's been life-changing, not just for me, but for every single person who works here. At one point, we joked that Thrive Life was the place for wayward counselors. We had a period of time where new clinicians joining our team were coming from other practices or nonprofit organizations in the area, feeling battered and bruised from their experiences with those systems. We became a rehabilitation space for clinicians to come down off the crazy train they had experienced in their previous workplaces and to stabilize and find meaning in their work again. When I say that I have watched this stuff work, this is what I'm talking about. I have watched professionals who were burnt out and debating whether they were meant for this profession flourish into the best versions of themselves when given the space to do so. As they offer their best, their clients flourish too, and the trickle effect goes from there. Over the coming weeks, we're going to be talking about some of the core skills identified in Brene Brown's work. We're going to talk about the ways that existing systems tend to fail in an effort to identify spaces where we can do better. We're going to work at growing our own capacities to be leaders, starting right now in the spaces we currently serve in, and growing this into becoming a generation of system-changing leaders. I know it sounds like a big job, but truly, somebody's got to do it, and you can. But this is also why I encourage you to share this resource, this podcast, with your coworkers and others in your life, because you shouldn't have to do it alone. And can you imagine the shift that could happen if many were on the same page together and were equipped with the skills to really enact something system-altering? If you haven't yet, consider sharing the podcast with your coworkers for this series and maybe even find some spaces to connect together about how to implement and engage with what we're discussing here in your specific workplace and with your workplace dynamics in mind. What I'll tell you at this point, both from Brene Brown's comprehensive research as well as my own personal experience implementing it, is that leading well means being willing to be vulnerable. Okay, be honest with me. How much did you cringe when you just heard me say the word vulnerable? It's probably one of the least liked words in the English language, especially for many on the front lines who, as a part of the job description, feel they need to exude tough, together, and rock solid as base characteristics at all times. Meanwhile, vulnerability is required to lean into our humanness and allow others permission to do the same. And it's only when we're allowed to be human that we can sort through the challenges, work toward the goals, and support each other's success well. When you think of the poor leadership you've experienced and interacted with, likely there is some amount of closed off, power tripping, and or disconnected. On occasion, I hear of poor leadership where the person would overshare, but we need to know that that is not the same as vulnerability. Brene Brown says this about leadership, quote, I define a leader as anyone who takes responsibility for finding the potential in people and processes and who has the courage to develop that potential. She goes on to identify three fundamental requirements at the heart of daring leadership. The first is that Quote, you can't get to courage without rumbling with vulnerability. Embrace the suck. Yep, embrace the suck are her words, not mine. She outlines that courage, as part of the definition of leadership, includes four skill sets. These include rumbling with vulnerability, 
living into our values, braving trust, and learning to rise. We'll be talking more about each of these over the next few weeks on the show, so don't worry if you're wondering what the heck all of that means. Of the second fundamental requirements at the heart of daring leadership, she says this, self-awareness and self-love matter. Who we are is how we lead. Any chance you're hearing that and thinking that it links back to our many episodes talking about resilience, mindfulness, self-care, and so on? If not, you should be. We've been tackling these exact topics because they reach into so many facets of who we are, including how we lead and influence the systems that we're a part of. Third on the list of fundamental requirements of daring leadership is that, quote, courage is contagious. To scale daring leadership, build courage in teams and organizations, we have to cultivate a culture in which brave work, tough conversations, and whole hearts are the expectation, and armor is not necessary or rewarded. End quote. Okay, I know that was a lot of quoting. I promise I won't do that all the time throughout this series, but I want you to hear and know some of the language we're going to be engaging with over the coming weeks. Vulnerability, rumbling, courage, daring leadership. This is going to be part of your vernacular by the end of this. Today, we're really just setting the stage for this series, and I'm hoping that you are as excited as I am to dive in. I also want to say that while you may not consider yourself leadership in whatever position you find yourself in, you are. You, as a member of an organization, have influence, directly or indirectly, in shaping it. Sometimes our shaping happens in very small chipping away, other times in wide-sweeping overhauling. But we shape nonetheless. Being the leader you wish to have, cultivating a culture of trust and care with your coworkers, engaging in the small influencing you can where you're able to, It adds up and it matters and others will notice and want to do the same because we're drawn to good leaders. We want more of that. We want to emulate that. And this is how we change the system from the inside out little bits at a time with a generation of professionals who are empowered with the knowledge and skills to care well for themselves and others and vicariously change the world. You with me? I am thankful for your time and for your heart that you want to invest in your workplace. I hope you'll continue to join me for this series. Keep investing in you and your own wellness. It vicariously benefits everyone who comes into contact with you. And your wellness is the best gift you can give others in your life. It's a direct precursor to solid leadership. So keep it up and make it a priority. If you haven't listened to some of our episodes about self-care and related topics, go back and check those out. As always, I love to hear from you and welcome you to connect by email or on social media. I would love to hear how you're enjoying the show, how it's going using some of the tools that we talk about, and any ideas of topics you would love for us to cover in future episodes. My contact info is always in the show notes. Keep up the good work. And until next time, stay safe.